Chapter 30, To the Dungeon. At the castle, for the first time in her young life, Mig had enough to eat. And eat she did. She quickly became plump and then plumper still. She grew rounder and rounder and bigger and bigger. Only her head stayed small. Reader, as the teller of this tale, it is my duty from time to time to utter some hard and rather disagreeable truths. In the spirit of honesty, then, I must inform you that Mig was the tiniest bit lazy. And two, she was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. That is, she was a bit slow-witted. Because of these shortcomings, Louise was hard-pressed to find a job that Miggery Sow could effectively perform in quick succession. Mig failed as a lady-in-waiting. She was caught trying on the gown of a visible duchess. A seamstress, she sewed the cloak of the riding master to her own frock and ruined both. And as a chambermaid sent to a clean room, she stood open-mouthed and delighted, admit, admiring the gold walls and floors and tapestries, exclaiming over and over again, "Got ain't it pretty? Got ain't it something then? And did no cleaning at all. And while Mig was trying and failing at these many domestic chores, other important things were happening in the castle. The rat in the dungeon below was pacing and muttering in the darkness, waiting to take his revenge on the princess. And upstairs in the castle, the princess had met a mouse, and the mouse had fallen in love with her. Will there be consequences? You bet. Just as Mig's inability to perform any job well had its consequences, for finally, as a last resort, Louise sent Mig to the kitchen. Louis sent Meg to the kitchen, where Cook had a reputation for dealing effectively with difficult help. In Cook's kitchen, Meg dropped eggshells in the pound cake batter. She scrubbed the kitchen floor with cooking oil instead of cleanser, and she sneezed directly on the king's pork chop moments before it was served to him. Gross. All of the good-for-nothings I have encountered, shouted Cook. Surely you are the worst, the most cauliflower-eared, the good for nothingness. There's only one place left for you, the dungeon. Eh, said Mig, cupping a hand around her ear. You are being sent to the dungeon. You are to take the jailer his noonday meal. That will be your duty from now on. Reader, you must know that the mice of the castle feared the dungeon. Must I tell you that the humans feared it too? Certainly it was never far from their thoughts. In the warm months, a foul odor rose out of its dark depths and permeated the whole of the castle. And in the still cold nights of winter, terrible howls issued from the dark place, as if the castle itself were weeping and moaning. It's only the wind, the people of the castle assured each other, nothing but the wind. Many a serving girl had been sent to the dungeon bearing the jailer's meal, only to return white-faced. and weeping, hands trembling, teeth chattering, insisting that they would never go back. And worse, there were whispered stories of those servant girls who had been given the job of feeding the jailer, who had gone down the stairs and into the dungeon, and who had never been seen or heard from again. Do you believe that this will be Meg's fate? Gore, I hope not. What kind of story would this be without Meg? Listen, you cauliflower-eared fool, shouted Cook. This is what you do. You take the tray of food down to the dungeon and you wait for the old man to eat the food and then you bring the tray back up. Do you think you can manage that? I, I reckon so, said Mig. I take the old man the tray, he eats what's on it, and then I bring the tray back up. Empty it would be. I bring the empty tray back up from the deep downs. That's right, said Cook. Seems simple, don't it? but I'm sure you'll find a way to bungle it. Eh, said Meg. Nothing, said the cook. Good luck to you. You'll be needing it. She watched as Meg descended the dungeon stairs. They were the very same stairs, reader, that the mouse Despero had been pushed down the day before. Unlike the mouse, however, Meg had a light on the tray with the food, and there was a single flickering candle to show her the way. She turned on the stairs and looked back at Cook and smiled. That cauliflower-eared good-for-nothing fool, said Cook, shaking her head. What's to become of someone who goes into the dungeon smiling, I ask you? Reader, for the answer to Cook's question, you must read on. Chapter 31, A Song in the Dark. 
The terrible foul odor of the dungeon did not bother Meg. Perhaps that is because sometimes when Uncle was giving her a good clout to the ear, he missed his mark and delivered a good clout to Meg, Meg's nose instead. This happened often enough that it interrupted the proper working of Meg's olfactory senses. And so it was that the overwhelming stench of despair and hopelessness and evil was not at all discernible to her. And she went happily down the twisting and turning stairs. Gore, she shouted. It's dark, ain't it? Yes, it is, Meg, she answered herself. But if I was a princess, I would be so glittery light-like. There wouldn't be a place in the world that was dark to me. And at this point, Miggery Sow broke into a little song that went something like this. I ain't the Princess P, but someday I will be. The P, ha he, someday I will be. Meg, as you can imagine, wasn't much of a singer. More of a bellower, really. But in her little song, there was, to the right-tuned ear, a certain kind of music. And as Mig went singing down the stairs of the dungeon, there appeared from the shadows a rat wrapped in a cloak of red, wearing a spoon on his head. Yes, yes, whispered the rat, a lovely song, just the song I've been waiting to hear. And Roscuro quite quietly fell in step beside Miggery Sow. At the bottom of the stairs, Mig shouted out into the darkness, Gore, it's me, Miggery Sow. Most calls me Mig, delivering your food. Come and get it, Mr. Deep Downs. There was no response. The dungeon was quiet, but it was not quiet in a good way. It was quiet in an ominous way. It was quiet in the way of small, frightening sounds. There was the snail-like slither of water oozing down the walls, and from around a darkened corner, there came the low moan of someone in pain, and then... Two, there was the noise of the rats going about their business, their sharp nails hitting the stones of the dungeon, and their long tails dragging behind them through the blood and the muck. Reader, if you were standing in the dungeon, you would certainly hear all of those disturbing and ominous sounds. If I were standing in the dungeon, I would hear those sounds. If, if we were standing in the dungeon, we would hear these sounds, and we would be very frightened. We would cling to each other in our fear. But what did Miggery Sow hear? That's right. Absolutely nothing. And so she was not afraid at all. Not in the least. She held the tray up higher and the candle shed its weak light on the towering pile of spoons and bowls and kettles. Gore, said Mig. Look at them things. I ain't never imagined there could be so many spoons in the whole wide world. There is more to this world than anyone could imagine, said a booming voice from the darkness. True, true, whispered Roscuro. The old jailer speaks truth. Gore, said Mig. Who said that? And she turned in the direction of the jailer's voice. Chapter 32, Beware of the Rats. The candlelight on Mig's tray revealed Gregory limping toward her, the thick rope tied around his ankle, his hands outstretched. You, Gregory presumes, have brought food for the jailer. Gore, said Mig. She took a step backward. Give it here, said Gregory. And he took the tray from Mig and sat down on an overturned kettle that had rolled free from the tower. He balanced the tray on his knees and stared at the covered plate. Gregory assumes that today, again, there is no soup. Eh, said Mig. Soup, shouted Gregory. Illegal, shouted Mig back. Most foolish, muttered Gregory as he lifted the cover off the plate. Too foolish to be born, a world without soup. He picked up a drumstick and put the whole of it in his mouth and chewed and swallowed. Here, said Mig, staring hard at him, you forgot the bones. Not forgotten. Chewed. Gore, said Mig, staring at Gregory with respect. You eats the bones. You are most ferocious. Gregory ate another piece of chicken, a wing, bones, and all, and then another. Mig watched him admiringly. Someday, she said, moved suddenly to tell this man her deepest wish, I will be a princess. And at this pronouncement, Chia Roscuro, who was still at Mig's side, did a small deliberate jig of joy in the light of the one candle. His dancing shadow was large and fearsome indeed. Gregory sees you, Gregory said to the rat's shadow. Roscuro ceased his dance. He moved to hide beneath Mig's skirt. Eh? shouted Mig. What's that? Oh, nothing, said Gregory. So you aim to be a princess? Well, everyone has a foolish dream, Gregory. For instance, dreams of a world where soup is legal. And that rat, Gregory is sure, has some foolish dream too. 
If only you knew, whispered Roscuro. What? shouted Meg. Gregory said nothing more. Instead, he reached into his pocket and then held his napkin up to his face and sneezed into it once, twice, three times. Bless you, shouted Meg. Bless you, bless you. Back to the world of light, Gregory whispered. And then he balled the napkin up and placed it on the tray. Gregory is done, he said, and he held the tray out to Meg. Done, are you? Then the tray goes back upstairs. Cook says it must. You take the tray to the deep downs. You wait for the old man to eat, and then you bring the tray back. Them's my instructions. Did they instruct you, too, to beware of the rats? The what? The rats. What about them? Beware of them, shouted Gregory. Right, said Mig. Beware of the rats. Rescura, hidden beneath Mig's skirts, rubbed his front paws together. Warn her all you like, old man, he whispered. My hour has arrived. The time is now and your rope must break. No nib, nib, nibbling this time. Rather a serious chew that will break it in two. Yes, it is all coming clear. Revenge is at hand. Can't wait to see what's going to happen next.